freedom of the press. A bedrock right in the United States is under threat around the world. The free press is not the enemy of the people. See how governments suppress the news and remembering those journalists killed or gone missing because of their work. Now, on the Inside Story, the Press Freedom Spotlight. I'm Katherine Gibson, VOA's Congressional Correspondent. We're outside VOA headquarters, which represents a cornerstone building block of American society, freedom of the press. It's part of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, along with freedom of speech and religion. But freedom of the press is not practiced everywhere. That's why we celebrate May 3rd as World Press Freedom Day, to spotlight transparency so government answers to the people it governs. World Press Freedom Day also gives us the opportunity to remember the journalists who are in prison for their reporting or killed while trying to do their jobs. Vera Hirich is one of them. My colleague from Radio Liberty was found dead on April 29th after a Russian missile hit her residential building in Kyiv. She is among 20 media workers killed since Russia attacked Ukraine in late February. Vera Hirich was 55 years old. Also under assault in Russia's war against Ukraine, factual information, especially for those living in Russia. VOA's Arash Arabasadi begins our press freedom spotlight. Propaganda, laws aimed at discrediting credible media, website bans, arrests. Moscow's assault on a free press ramped up as Russian troops invaded Ukraine. In doing so, Russia's media freedom rating declined, moving it closer to the bottom of the 2022 World Press Freedom Index produced by Reporters Without Borders, or RSF. The annual index classifies a record 28 countries as having very bad media freedom. They join the likes of China, which is exporting censorship beyond its borders while amplifying Kremlin propaganda. Under Beijing's influence, Hong Kong registered a dramatic decline, ranking 148th out of 180 on the index after a series of raids and arrests shuttered pro-democracy news sites. Ethiopia and Nicaragua also registered steep declines after moves by authorities to suppress, censor, or block media. More troubling, says RSF, is the impact media polarization and disinformation has on society. In 2022, it's really undeniable that uh, media polarization and information chaos are really fueling social divisions in ways that are pretty new. Power grabs also impacted the media environment, in some cases wiping out years of progress. The coup in Myanmar marked a 10-year setback for media rights, with journalists detained, media licenses revoked, and many news outlets returning to exile. In Afghanistan, the Taliban pledged to uphold press freedom, but instead imposed restrictive laws and blocked female journalists from the airwaves. Media outlets are facing financial hardship after bans on entertainment and advertising cut revenue. And in Ethiopia, the war in the Tigray region with the communication blackouts and restricted access resulted in a 13-point drop to 114 on the index. A disappointing result for a country that just three years ago was lauded for its reforms. The downward trend in authoritarian tactics have spread, says RSF. There is a contagion effect with authoritarian regimes, and when we allow a culture of impunity to exist where uh, authoritarians are allowed to go after journalists, harass them, arrest them, beat them in the streets, or even kill them, it uh, has a knock-on effect. It emboldens that same authoritarian to do it again next time, and it emboldens other authoritarians who are watching to do the same. The U.S. made a slight improvement compared with 2021, but journalists and media outlets are flagging barriers to coverage, including of state governments and protests. We typically find that this is either due to just a blatant disregard for the laws governing open records or open meetings, or they're simply misinterpreting them. An individual is misinterpreting whether a journalist can be present at a particular event. Democracies play an important role in safeguarding press freedom, but RSF finds this rise in disinformation and propaganda is having a disastrous effect on independent news. For Sirwan K. Joe, I'm Arash Arabasadi, 
VOA News. President Biden took aim at disinformation when he told journalists that American democracy is not a reality show. Biden spoke to the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, an event celebrating journalists and their work. Acknowledging there have been significant changes and increased pressure in the news industry, Biden emphasized that truth matters. A poison is running through our democracy. Of all, all this taking place, with disinformation massively on the rise, where the truth is buried by lies and the lies live on as truth. What's clear, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that you, the free press, matter more than you ever did in the last century. Now, I really mean it. I've always believed that good journalism holds up a mirror to ourselves to reflect on the good, the bad, and the truth. Nine have been killed, reporting from Kyiv, struck by a kamikaze drone strike after a shopping mall attack, shot in the neck while, declouncing, while, while documenting Ukrainian fleeing, killed when Russian missiles hit the television tower in a residential neighborhood. One journalist from Radio Liberty just killed days ago. So many of you telling the stories and taking the photos and recording the videos of what's happening there. The unvarnished truth shown, showing and this, this, the destruction and the devastation and, yes, the war crimes. We honor journalists killed, missing, imprisoned, detained and tortured, covering war, exposing corruption and holding leaders accountable. We honor members of the press, both national and local, covering the once in a century pandemic when we lost a million Americans. A generation reckoning on race, an existential threat, climate change. The free press is not the enemy of the people. Far from it. At your best, you're guardians of the truth. President Kennedy once said, and I quote, without debate, without criticism, no administration, no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. The First Amendment grants a free press extraordinary protection. But with it comes, as many of you know, a very heavy obligation to seek the truth as best you can, not to inflame or entertain, but to illuminate and educate. I know it's tough, and I'm not being solicitous. The industry is changing significantly. There's incredible pressure on you all to deliver heat instead of shed light because the technology is changing so much. The system is changing. But it matters. No kidding. It matters. The truth matters. American democracy is not a reality show. It's not a reality show. It's reality itself. And the reality is that we are a great country. Good journalism, good satire about our leaders, about our society, is quintessentially an American thing. It demonstrates the power of our example. And I honest to God believe it reveals our soul, the soul of our nation. And that's what I'd like to toast tonight. By May. To the journalists and their families, to the people and the elected representatives, to the United States of America. A national security law passed in 2020 has tightened China's grip on Hong Kong and driven most of its free media outlets out of business. 
Our Laurel Bowman explains how practicing journalism in Hong Kong has become precarious work. First to fall in June 2021 was Apple Daily and its founder, Jimmy Lai. The newspaper that praised Hong Kong's 2019 pro-democracy movement was loathed by Beijing's leadership. With its executives charged under the national security law, the paper's assets were frozen. Lai, an outspoken critic of the Chinese Communist Party, is now in prison. For many Hong Kongers, the newspaper's demise sent a chill. It's like death, because Hong Kong is supposed to have freedom of press and speech. If the last organization that speaks for Hong Kong disappears, I don't want to live here anymore. Apple Daily was not the last. In late December, National Security Police raided the pro-democracy news website Stand News. Its assets were frozen and boxes of evidence, including computers, phones and journalistic materials, were carted away. Crowds showed up in support of two editors who had been charged with sedition. Their arrests came even after Stan News had said it would cease operations. The risk of lawsuits is changing how media think, says Ronson Chan, a former Stan News journalist who chairs the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Police spent five hours searching his sparse apartment. Chan spoke to VOA via Skype. No one could could um, escape from the from the law from the NSL NSL, so so you may bear very high risk if you do some something very sensitive or or something. So I think I feel quite sad about the future of this journalism in Hong Kong. A week later, Citizen News threw in the towel. I am unsure whether a story, a piece of news, or a sentence will violate a new regulation under the changing news environment. If I can't confidently let my reporters continue to do what we are doing, then I should stop. As a leader, I am responsible for journalists, after all. She added that journalists need to feel safe in their jobs. Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam says... Western governments critical of the news outlet's closures don't understand Hong Kong law. Journalists are respected, but they must practice their trade properly, she says. If you breach the law but package yourself as a practitioner in the press, then we need to see through that to be able to tell what's actually happening, and the law enforcement department should take action. Press freedom advocates say it's a precarious time to be a journalist in Hong Kong. I think uh, here in Hong Kong at the moment, journalists are distressed, uh, they're frightened, they're despairing, uh, but they're trying to get on with their jobs um, as best they can. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough time if you know Hong Kong the way it used to be. Uh, this place used to be probably the freest uh, in Asia and mm. this part of the world for, for the press. Now with pro-democracy media closing and laws making journalists wary of covering political news, that freedom appears limited. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Press freedom is challenged in both overt and subversive ways. For example, sexual harassment. From Nairobi, Victoria Munga shows us how women are fighting back in Kenya's newsrooms. Gadoni Kuria's negative experience with a supervisor at a Kenyan media outlet derailed her plans for a career in journalism. I went to pitch an idea to him, and he was just looking at my hips intentionally, very intentionally. Like, he, he, I'm speaking to him, but he's like just looking at my hips and then going up to my breast and not looking at my face. Kuria worked at the same media house for two years, trying to launch her career in print and broadcast. But she says rejecting sexual advances from a supervisor changed that trajectory. Her harasser wasn't interested in her professional growth. He did not really care whether I published or not. He did not even sweat or struggle to, to, to even tell me go do a certain story unless I came up with an idea. And that idea would be merged up sometimes with someone else's story. So you see, I became all, almost like just a trophy seated at the desk. Kuria's former supervisor told VOA her claims are ridiculous and suggested she report them to the police. 
Curious case isn't isolated. Around 65% of female journalists surveyed in Kenya say they face physical or verbal harassment. The figure puts Kenya top of a list of 20 countries included in a study by the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers or one IFRA's Women in News organization and City University of London. The study also shows in about 80% of cases, women do not report the incidents. One way to curb the problem is to highlight it, say local advocates. Create that open environment and safe spaces for people to talk about sexual harassment. Then the person who wants to hide in, in, in the secrecy of it to harass their victims will... Um, of course, they will feel exposed. It can be hard to secure justice too. Harassers risk being fired, but they still find work elsewhere. So the Association of Women Media in Kenya is creating a special committee to help bring suspected attackers to court. There are cases where we've had even an intern uh, raped at a gunpoint uh, in Kisumu. But if you look at, look at even how that case was handled, the media house sat, listened to the case, found the, girl, uh, the guy guilty and fired him. But after he was fired, went to another media house. So the cycle continues. There's no redress. There's no punishment. There's no justice for the victim. Kuria, for now, has abandoned her aspirations to be a journalist. But media advocates hope the Women in News study will shine a light on sexual harassment in the newsrooms and offer support for reporters like Kuria. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. One of the ways governments suppress and persecute journalists is through vague laws against offensive communication, which serves to stifle criticism of the leaders of a country. Journalists in Uganda face that situation daily. Halima Uthmani explains from the capital, Kampala. The online television station Digitok is still recovering after Ugandan security forces raided their office in March, confiscating equipment and arresting nine staffers. Digitok administrator Farida Vikomede says she was beaten by security forces while in custody. So they will target the parts of the body that you will be afraid to show. So yeah, even you, I cannot come in, the, and unless I'm mad, I cannot come in, they come in from the camera and dress and show people. Even when I was beaten in my stomach, the bleeding is internal. Author and Digitalk founder Norman Tumuhimbise says security personnel put a hot leather blanket over his face. They asked him why he continued to annoy the state. He says by writing books that are critical of President Yoram Seveni and his family. If our leaders were reasonable enough, they would instead award us for giving them prophecies and wonderful ideas through which they can change this country. No one's at a personal level. I am not against him, Mr. Seven and his son or the entire team of those tax beneficiaries, but I am against any form of administrative mismanagement of this country. Uganda's security forces deny torturing and abusing the journalists. The digital workers were released on bail but were charged with cyber stalking and offensive communication which could get them up to seven years in prison. The Human Rights Network for Journalists Uganda says there were 131 attacks on media last year and many were intended to scare them away from covering sensitive issues. So you really see that uh, um, um, uh, journalists towing lines of covering the po political dissent, of covering uh, uh, the transition in this country, political transition, but also criticizing uh, the first family are not in a safe haven. It's a very dangerous area too for, for anyone. Uganda's information minister denies any risk in reporting on or writing about the president or his family, but he warns there is a legal limit. But also use especially the digital platforms to insult, to abuse, to offend, and some of those communication is definitely against the law of Uganda. So in some instances, security uh, officers may swing into action if somebody is publishing excesses. The 2021 Press Freedom Index shows that in the past five years, Uganda has more than 700 documented cases of human rights abuses and violations against journalists. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. According to data collected by the Committee to Protect Journalists, 27 journalists have been killed so far this year. Eight of them took place in Mexico. 
Sydney Johnson explains what's happening to make Mexico such a deadly place for journalists to work. Loved ones and colleagues mourn the loss of yet another journalist in Mexico. Reporter Armando Lenar is the eighth journalist killed in 2022. Media members are demanding justice for Lenar and others, like Herbert Lopez. He was fatally shot in Oaxaca State in March after publishing a report on corruption and receiving threats for years. We demand justice to the federal and state agencies because we, the journalists, need to have the guarantees in order to work. What happened to Heber, what they did to him in front of his family, is very complicated because he didn't deserve this and neither do we. Lernar was shot just six weeks after his colleague Roberto Toledo was killed. Their deaths mark a violent year for Mexico's media, with four journalists killed in January, two in February, and two in March. 34 Mexican journalists have been slain for their reporting between 2011 to 2021, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Nearly every case is unsolved. Protests calling for an end to the violence took place in more than a dozen cities across Mexico. U.S. Senators Tim Kaine and Marco Rubio are urging the State Department to work closely with Mexico to ensure media are protected. We journalists would like to find in the federal and state governments solidarity with the press, but we see indifference and direct attacks in other cases. It seems to replicate what they do in Manioneras to prosecute critical journalists. This seems to be replicated in the states. Remember that behind a threat to a journalist, there is always the intention of attacking freedom of expression and in many cases, even the murder of our colleagues. President Andres Manuel López Obrador in January blamed the bloodshed on societal decay and misguided government policies of the past. Many journalists say they feel defenseless. The silent scream is to say, look at us and listen to us because we are tired of being ignored and killed by this government and all other governments. They want to silence the press, but are in fact trying to silence society. With violence rising, Mexico's journalists take part in an increasingly dangerous profession. Sydney Johnson for VOA News. For more stories about journalists overcoming obstacles to report reliable and accurate news and information, check out voanews.com for our press freedom section. Connect with us at VOA News on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on Twitter at KGYP, that's K-G-Y-P. I'm standing in front of our wall of honor. Journalists from VOA, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and El Hura who were killed while working to bring you the news and information you need and deserve. Before we go, a moment for those journalists we similarly lost or went missing in the past year.